One of the most powerful and common uses for parametric equations is in modeling real life situations. In particular, the motion of a particle in the X and Y directions, horizontally and vertically, for instance, um, it's very often connected directly to the time that's gone by. And in many cases, like in this one, the expressions used for X and for Y in terms of T are not necessarily functions that play well together. Five plus ln t is a somewhat different language to five sine two t. One is a trig function, one is a log graph. They don't necessarily behave well or simplify nicely. So if you're trying to combine x and y, it's possible, but it's not gonna give you a particularly nice function to work with or to calculate from. And it won't give you much insight into the motion. However, in parametric form, we can start seeing things straight away. In the x direction, for instance, we know what the log graph looks like. It starts massively negative, just above zero, with an asymptote at x equals zero, and then it increases rapidly till it gets to the point one zero, and it continues to increase, but more and more slowly. So in the x direction, as you can see from the animation, we're moving sideways very quickly, so quickly, in fact, you can't even see the dots that are giving negative values for x, although in the original questions diagram, you can see part of the path happens before the y-axis. But then the motion slows down in the x direction, so much so that by the time we reach the end, it's hardly moving sideways at all. Almost all of its motion is vertical. And at the same time, we can see what's happening in the y direction. In the y direction, we have five sine two t. So we've got a trig function, sine is periodic. So if we allowed t to vary sufficiently, we'd find this thing would go up and down between five and minus five consistently. The rate at which it does that is determined by the two in front of the t. So that gives you the frequency of the sine wave. And that's why this has its peak and then comes back down to zero all within the range naught to pi by two. Whereas ordinarily it would take a naught to pi range to do that. Don't be deceived by the values on the x-axis. These do not correspond directly to the values of t. So if we look at the point as it goes along, when it reaches the end of its path, that point, which corresponds to roughly 5.5, 0, that point corresponds to a t-value of pi by 2. So let's dive in. Part A, find the coordinates of the point where t equals pi by six. This is just a case of routinely substituting in a value. So we can put in pi by six to the x equation, five plus ln pi by six, and to the y equation, five sine two lots of pi by six. And it's worth pointing out here that because we're dealing with a modeling situation where the path of a roller coaster, in other words, some real physical thing is being approximated by a mathematical model, it doesn't make a lot of sense to leave our answer in the exact form. Five plus ln pi by six is a lovely precise number, but it doesn't make sense in this context to use the most precise number. It will be a little bit like estimating the height of the Eiffel Tower to be approximately 100 pi meters tall. The precision gives an impression of accuracy which isn't really there. In this case, it would make more sense, just like in a mechanics question, to round the answers to a sensible degree of accuracy. So we've used three significant figures here, which is fairly standard. So the X and Y coordinates are roughly 4.35, 4.33. That's where the graph is at the point when T equals pi by six. And we can check. I've drawn this on so you can kind of see at which moments this is happening. But because pi by 6 is the value when sine will be giving 3 over 2, in other words, about 0.8 something, we're most of the way up to 5. You can see the point that we're dealing with here, somewhere around there. So it seems plausible. It fits with the graph. And you wouldn't even need necessarily to have a very precise idea of exactly where or when it happens. But the fact that that point appears to be somewhere on the curve, given that the curve goes as high as 5, getting an answer of 4 point something, 4 point something, seems reasonable. For the next part, we're looking for the maximum height of the roller coaster, and there's a couple of things to be aware of here. They like to incorporate bits within the questions that require you to think specifically and consciously about the mathematical model 
You can't just skip over the stuff about the roller coaster and then ignore it and treat it as if it's just an ordinary parametric equations question. Much of the maths will be the same, that's true, but there will be details that you need to be cognizant of. In particular, in this case, one unit on the model represents five meters in real life. So when we get to an answer of five for the y coordinate, we need to convert that to a height of 25. Notice here, although the curve itself might be a complicated curve and would look pretty complicated if you wrote it in Cartesian form with just x's and y's, finding the maximum point does not require any calculus. The maximum point can be identified just by considering when is y as large as possible. And because of the type of function y is, you don't need to differentiate it to find out. y will be its largest when sine 2t equals 1, which gives y equals 5. And we're going to make use of that as well for the second part. To find the horizontal distance covered during the descent, we're going to need to know exactly where we are when we get to that highest point. Just knowing that we reach a height of 5 is not enough. We need to use that to work out what the value of t would be. And it turns out that's pi by 4. We can check that that's plausible. We had pi by 6, we've already marked on the graph. Pi by 4 is a bit bigger. Pi by 6 is 30 degrees, pi by 4 is 45. So we go a little further and we reach the top. That also seems consistent, plausible. But when we use that pi by 4, we can then go to the x equation that we're given and substitute that back in. That will give you the x coordinate. And you could check on the calculator if you like to see if that's plausible. If you do ln of pi by 4 and then add 5, we get 4.76. So it is further along than the t equals pi by 6 point which makes sense. More importantly, we need that x value in order to calculate the horizontal distance covered during the descent. Now the descent occurs from this point all the way down to this point. So we just need this distance here. And that distance can be calculated most easily by identifying the x coordinates at each end. So that's what I do. At the maximum height, we've got an x-coordinate of 5 plus ln pi by 2. At the end, we have an x-coordinate of 5 plus ln pi by 2. So 5 plus ln pi by 4 is the top. 5 plus ln pi by 2 is the end. So this point here is when t equals pi by 2. That's the extreme end of the range. And when you subtract one from the other, a couple of clever things happen. Firstly, the fives cancel because you're doing five in one bracket, you're taking away the five in the other bracket. But also we've got a bit of log rules which allows the pi's to cancel. ln of something minus ln of something else. We can invoke the log rule that says you can divide. If you've got two logs that are subtracted, you can convert it to a single log with the quotient of the terms inside. In other words, ln of pi by two over pi by four. So a half divided by a quarter gives two. So we get ln2, which is nice and elegant. But even though it's a nice exact answer and it looks nice, we still need to remember that this is a modeling question where the curve we're given is just an approximation for something in real life. So when we calculate the horizontal distance, not forgetting to multiply by 5 because one unit on the model represents 5 meters in real life. When we do that, we get 5 ln2. We then convert it again to three significant figures. And that gives the total distance covered. You can check on the graph that ln2 is a plausible value, but then bear in mind when you multiply by 5, you'll get 3 point something. So your graph may look like an answer less than 1, but the actual distance is going to be more like 3. Compare that with a height of 25. That seems plausible. So you drop from a height of 25 and you cover 3.47 meters horizontally along the way. That seems to fit with the scale of the graph. The final bit is the average gradient of the descent. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll be thinking calculus again as soon as you see gradient, but this does not require calculus. The average gradient is actually a much simpler concept. This is more like the average speed. If I ask you for my average speed, um, when I drive to Scotland, it takes me 10 hours and I cover 500 miles, you don't need to know whether I was traveling faster or slower than 50 miles an hour at various points along the way, 
all you need is the total distance and the total time. And it's the same with this. You can think of this as being the gradient of the straight line. I'm not going to be able to draw a very good straight line here. But the gradient of the straight line between the top and the bottom. So imagine we link it with a segment, a line segment, and we find the gradient of that line. At some points along the way, like here, we're going to be less steep. And at some points, like here, it's going to be more steep. So sometimes we're not descending as quickly as the line predicts, and sometimes we're descending more quickly than the line predicts. But on average, because we end up in the same place, the average descent is the same. The other thing to watch out for that I made a mistake when I first did this was a negative sign. We drop 25 meters. We do it over the course of 5 ln 2 or 3.47 meters. But because we're dropping 25 meters, that needs to be a negative 25. So the gradient of descent is minus 7.21. When a space probe wants to get up speed, a very handy technique that's applied is a gravity assist or a slingshot maneuver. The idea is you fly close to a large body like Jupiter and you approach very quickly. You go whizzing past, you don't quite hit it, you swing past and the gravity of the planet pulls you around, changing your direction and flinging you off the other side faster than you came in. Um, now, in this context, we've got a slightly more simplified version, but the curve is still the same curve. Um, we don't gain speed in this case, we don't um, steal momentum from the planet exactly, but we're demonstrating the same kind of motion. You come in and you career around and you slingshot off in a different direction. You'll recognize the curve when we end up drawing it, and you might be able to guess what kind of thing it will come out as based on the type of functions that X and Y are showing. But our job is to sketch this, and we're also given a bit of a clue, state the range of X and Y values for the given domain of T. So that's gonna be one of the first things we need to do when we're sketching a curve anyway, to make sense of how far it goes and in what direction. It's also worth noticing that T is defined between minus three and three. So there's a definite end point at each side. It's not just T is greater than or equal to zero or something like that. Um, so there will be an end and a beginning and we need to consider those points. Now it's tempting just to plug those numbers into X and Y and find the end points in terms of X and Y. And that's exactly what we're going to do. But before we do that, I want to emphasize that finding the end points is necessary, but not sufficient. We need to do it. We need to know what's happening at the ends, but it's not enough to get a complete sense of what things do. If I glance out the window and see that my daughter is three meters away from the house, and then I come back in, do some maths and glance out the window again, find that she's five meters away from the house. That does not prove that she has been between three and five meters from the house the entire time. It's quite possible that she's wandered to the end of the road, stolen a daffodil and wandered back. So we need to look carefully at our curve to see if it's gone hunting for flowers along the way. In other words, we need to look for stationary points. If a curve goes away from its starting point and then has to return back to its finishing point, then it has to turn at some point. And it's the turn that we can identify by looking for stationary points. But let's start with the ends. Let's put the extreme values in. When t is negative three, we get negative three squared, add negative three, giving six. And y will be negative three squared minus negative three, giving 12. Similarly, if t equals 3, we get x equals 12 and y equals 6. Now, you might feel a little concerned about the fact that I've confidently given x and y values here, substituting in a value of t, which it is clear from our inequality, t is not allowed to be. The reason this is OK at this point is that we're identifying the boundaries or the extreme points. We are not claiming ownership of that point. This is a bit like marking the boundary line between your garden and someone else's, but you haven't decided who owns the fence yet. We know where the fence is and we're happy to talk about the fence. When we get to the final line, we're going to need to take that into account and decide whether or not we can take the value of six for X and the value of 12 for Y or not. The next thing we look at, like we've said, are there any turning points? 
The easiest way to do it for this one is probably just completing the square, although feel free to use calculus if that seems more straightforward. The calculator will help you as well if you want to get minimum or maximum values for a quadratic function. That's pretty quick and easy with the calculator functions. We can see that x, which is this first one here, x takes a value of negative a quarter and it happens when t equals minus a half. And then y takes a value of negative a quarter as well. That's the lowest it ever gets. And that happens when t equals positive a half. In other words, although x and y appear to vary between 6 and 12, along the way, they drop as low as negative a quarter. Both of them do. There's lots of nice symmetry in this one. Um, but we can give our final results for the range for x and the range for y. They'll look something like this. Now look closely and you'll see the inequality signs trying to make sense of why they are what they are. First time I ran through this, I made a mistake with the inequality signs. So make sure you understand why these are correct. Firstly, x can get as high as 12, but not equal to 12. In other words, we can get as close to 12 as we like, but we can't actually take the value of 12. 12 is our maximum, but it's not a maximum we attain. That's another way of saying it. And similarly, y has a maximum value of 12, but it never attains its maximum. So we use a strict inequality sign at the top end. Now at the bottom end, you'll notice 6 has dropped off the radar. 6 is no longer the minimum, because although it was the smallest of the two endpoints, it's not the smallest that x or y takes altogether. They both go lower. x gets as low as minus a quarter, and y gets as low as minus a quarter. But these don't have strict inequality signs. They have less than or equal to signs. And that's because y can take the value minus a quarter and x can take the value minus a quarter. We know when it happens as well. It happens when t equals a half or when t equals minus a half, each of those different bits. The next thing we do is exactly the same thing you would ordinarily do if you're sketching any other curve. It's easy to get confused and feel a little bit lost with parametric equations because they feel very different. But all the fundamental things you've learned about curves, they pretty much all apply here, just with a few cautionary warnings along the way. In this case, you want to find out where the graph crosses the x-axis, you set y equal to zero. You want to find out where it crosses the y-axis, you set x equal to zero. The only question that's different in here is how we deal with the results. When you set y equal to zero, you don't get an x value, you get a t value. But that's not a big problem. If I say what happens when y is zero and find a t value, I can then substitute that t value into the x equation and get an x value. So that's what we do. If x is zero, we solve that little quadratic, we get zero and negative one for t. Each of those corresponds to a different y value, so we get zero and two. There are two points where the x coordinate is zero. So these are the y intercepts, the point zero, zero and the point zero, two. We can do the same thing for y, and predictably enough, we get some repetition because we had 0, 0 before. That's an x and a y intercept. But there's a third intercept point as well that we haven't seen yet. That's the point 2, 0. Once you've got those roots and you've got information about the minimum value for y and the minimum value for x, you know quite a lot about the function. The last thing to look at is the nature of the function. In other words, Another phrase that's used for this is the long term behavior of the function. So for this, you can almost ignore the original domain you were given for t and just think about the functions in general. X is t squared add t. It's a positive quadratic. It starts high, ends high. The classic smiley face look. And y is t squared minus t. It's also a positive quadratic. It also starts with large positive numbers and ends with large positive numbers. We know they both dip as low as negative a quarter, but we know that they both start high and end high. So in the x direction, we're starting on the far right and we come in until we get to minus a quarter in the x direction. And then we go back to the extreme right again. In the y direction, we start at the top. We come down as low as minus a quarter and then we go back up until we disappear off towards the top. Now, in our particular situation, we don't disappear. We don't come down from positive infinity and back up to positive infinity. We start at the point 612 or just beyond the point 612, if you like. 
if you want to be really particular about it, you can put a little hollow circle at the point 612, just like you would in a graphical representation of a linear inequality at GCSE. We have the point 612 as the boundary, but it's not a boundary you can attain. So this is what our graph should look like. You probably recognize that one. It's a close cousin of your tried and trusted friend, the y equals x squared graph but a couple of little things have happened to it. The details of how we convert a y equals x squared graph into this particular graph, which is still a quadratic, just has a slightly messier equation. Um, the details of that you'll get into if you do further maths. When we look at matrix transformations, there are a sophisticated way to convert one function or curve or picture into another one by a series of distortions, stretches, rotations, reflections, all the standard things you might naturally do to a shape. We have a mathematical way of applying a rule that does that for us. That's how I generated these equations in the first place, actually. And if you look closely, hopefully you'll recognize this as a 45 degree clockwise rotation from a more normal looking y equals x squared type graph. It's also had a bit of a stretch applied to make the numbers nicer. You can identify the endpoints on here we have the point 612 that's our starting point and we have the point 12 6 that's our end point and your exam board if you're at Excel it's not too picky about exactly how you mark those endpoints but if you want it to be thorough because we don't include them you might want to put a little circle at the end a hollow circle to represent the fact that we have this point as our extreme point but it's a point that we never quite reach we don't attain that point so we come down from here we shoot off in this direction and we hit the y-axis where we expected at the zero two we have our minimum in the x direction minus a quarter that happens when t equals minus a half if you want to know what the y value is you'd have to solve t squared minus t equals minus a half to get the y coordinate of that. One of the things to be careful of here is that every point on the curve has an x coordinate, a y coordinate, and a t value. So the moment in time when it happened is a nice way to think of that. So take care if you're thinking of a t value with an x coordinate, it's not the same as an x coordinate and a y coordinate. All the key points we saw are represented on there, and the graph continues on until it finishes at the extreme end. And that's the slingshot maneuver.